Today is the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. The epistle is taken from St. Paul to the Catholics in Rome, chapter 8. Brethren, we are dead to us, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you shall die. But if by the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. For whosoever are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have received the Spirit, you have not received the Spirit of slavery again in fear, but you have received the Spirit of adoption of sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. For the Spirit Himself giveth testimony to our spirit that we are the sons of God. And if sons, heirs also, heirs indeed of God, and joint heirs with Christ. The Holy Gospel. <clears throat> Taken from St. Luke, chapter 16. At that time, Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable. There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said to him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for now thou canst no longer be steward. And the steward said within himself, What shall I do? Because my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. To dig I am not able, to beg I am ashamed. I know what I will do, that when I shall be removed from the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Therefore, calling together every one of his Lord's debtors, he said to the first, How much dost thou owe, my Lord? And he said, A hundred barrel, barrels of oil. And he said to him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much dost thou owe? Who said, A hundred quarters of wheat. He said to him, Take thy bill, and write eighty. <clears throat> and the Lord commended the unjust steward for as much as he had done wisely. For the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of the light. And I say to you, make unto you friends of the man of iniquity, that when you shall fail, they may receive you into everlasting dwellings. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. <clears throat> My time, my time is very limited here. I have a flight to catch at, at 4.10 to Quebec City for the third mass. So um, to be very uh, brief and to the point, be aware that there are retreats at the seminary in Boston, Kentucky. The men's retreat is, our, is July 27th to August 1st. July 27th to August 1st, men's retreat. Women's Retreat, August 3rd to the 8th. August 3rd to the 8th, Women's Retreat. Also, please pray for Joe Manns, Joseph Manns, <clears throat> who died in Philadelphia. He was uh, an old-time warrior for the faith, and uh, he came on retreat actually last year. <clears throat> and Joe uh, died in his old age, and uh, died in the sacraments, and uh, was a he, he always prayed, he always studied, he always tried to, to see where the Holy Ghost was guiding him. And from the very beginning he was coming to the Mass of the Resistance Priests in uh, Philadelphia. So do pray for his soul. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. In this parable we have, it's a, it's a very... <clears throat> profound parable, but I just want to take a little bit from it, some from St. Anthony of Padua. St. Anthony who uh, speaks about this, he says, the rich man is Christ. Christ is rich in his divinity, and he's a man in his, in his humanity who took on our flesh. And Christ puts his priests and the bishops and the Pope to be stewards over the souls of the Catholic Church. And their duty is to look after them and to feed them and to warn them of the fires of hell and the traps of the devil and to teach them the good doctrine 
And the priest, St. Anthony, really gets on the priests. In his day, they were, they were uh, practicing simony and uh, scandalizing people with girlfriends. And this is in the 1200s. So it took saints to rise up and point to the moral corruption of the, of the clergy. Today we have it worse. We have the moral corruption, but also the loss of the faith. It's much worse when even the Pope himself is no longer teaching what Christ commanded him to teach. And he's no longer feeding the flock as Christ commanded Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. The lambs are all the faithful, the other lambs are the priests, the sheep are the bishops. And the duty of the Pope is to make sure the Catholic faith is kept. And no one, no priest, bishop, laity, anyone, not even Pope, has the right to change the catechism, has the right to change the Catholic faith. They don't have that right. And if they do, even the tiniest little girl must stand up to the Pope, like St. Catherine of Siena, and tell him it is the duty, because the Catholic faith is objective. It's so beautiful, it's victorious, it comes from Christ, and nobody has the right to change and to compromise it. So what does St. Anthony says? He says that the oil, the hundred barrels of oil, is oil is the love of God. And this is what St. Anthony says, it's very beautiful what he says. A hundred barrels of oil, that is, I owe him all the perfection of love, that is to God, each soul. Because I am bound to love him with all my heart, and all my soul, and all my strength. But because I am a sinner, I am unable to attain that perfection. Then the church's steward, that is the Catholic priest, looking ahead for both himself and for him, should say, take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. The bill or account is the brief written record. Note these three, in which true penitence consists, says St. Anthony. The priest must say to the sinner, because you cannot yet rise to the perfection of the highest love of God, take your bill and prepare your life to do penance. Sit down quickly in heartfelt contrition, because the time is short and write, write down by oral confession, write down 50 in the works of satisfaction. In other words, uh, we cannot love God perfectly. The priest tells you, all right, make a good confession. Be sorry for your sins, do your penance, and that will be pleasing to God. You will find more about the number 50, he says later on. And then what about the 100 quarters of wheat? Wheat symbolizes the love of our neighbor, says St. Anthony. And so he says very much the same. Write down 80 quarters of wheat. The priest must tell the faithful, take your copy, prepare your mind's course to love your neighbor and write 80. That is, teach your neighbor so that he does not stray. And you teach as St. Francis de Sale, excuse me, St. Francis of Assisi said, I preach always, and sometimes with words. I preach always, and sometimes with words. And think of you fathers of families, your mothers, your husbands and wives, and when you go shopping and work, your example, your example preaches always. How ladies dress, how you speak, how you deal in business with honesty and not lying and cheating, what your jokes are, what your conversation is like. All that reflects who you belong to, Christ or the devil. Who do you love most, Christ the King or the devil in this world? All that we say, all that we act, how we dress, how we are, what our love is, what we speak and spend our efforts most on, shows what we really love. And if we love God, we will seek Him always. 
And so we must teach our neighbor, our children, our wife, our husband, we must always teach by good example and sometimes with words. And also uh, refresh his body, that is, the temporal benefits of which the works of mercy are. To the hungry, give to, to eat. To the thirsty, to drink. To the homeless, a home. To the prisoned, go and visit. And all these works of mercy, corporal works of mercy, spiritual works of mercy, um, these are the great acts of charity towards our neighbor. So these, these writing down the 50 barrels of oil, 80 quarters of wheat, is we cannot always attain to the perfection God expects of us. He perfectly says that your Heavenly Father is perfect, but who can match that? But what, what we can do is make good confession, make satisfaction for our sins by penance, and love our neighbor uh, for the love of God, and love God with all our heart, our strength, and our mind. And to love God with all our heart, strength, and mind means we must always be ready to profess Him. We must always be ready to, to even lay down our life for Almighty God. And we have a, a beautiful Catholic history. We have the history of the Catholic Church for the first 300 years, 11, up to 11 million martyrs by the time of the year 313. And then you have the martyrs of the Revolution, when the, after the age of the Christendom, the, the high Middle Ages, when the world recognized Christ as King, and uh, you had most everywhere the union of church and state rather than the separation. The separation leads to what we got now. Abortion, killing of our old people, or, uh, killing of innocent young people by organ donation to get their heart, to get their liver, which is, which is murder. We have no right, the doctors have no right to cut someone and take his heart when they're still breathing, when their blood is still circulating. And in the name of brain death, this is going on all over the world, especially the corrupted West. And that is murder, a systematized murder. And the Pope is silent about it, the bishops are silent about it, the priests are silent about it. And it's legalized, performed murder going on in our local hospitals, along with abortions by the millions. And then in the United States, two weeks ago, passed the horrible sodomite law Canada already has it. Dear friends, the West has written its death sentence. The West has written its invitation to God of fire and brimstone. God is not mocked. And there is a, there is a saying, if God, if God burnt down with fire and brimstone, Sodom and Gomorrah, and he doesn't do the West, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. But the West has grown more corrupt because Sodom and Gomorrahites, they didn't know about the love of Jesus crucified. They didn't know about the sacraments and the history of the Catholic Church with all their martyrs and saints and great popes, good popes that used to be. And God will give us another good pope that is prophesied. And these Sodomites of Sodom and Gomorrah, they didn't know what we know. They didn't know the treasures we have. And so our apostate modern age deserves a greater punishment than Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know all the prophecies of Fatima, the prophecies of Lassandet, the prophecies of many saints who say Russia will be the instrument to punish the West. And you can see all of the Western leaders provoking Vladimir Putin, provoking him to war. And he's stepping back and saying he doesn't want war. But God knows, whether it's Putin or fire from heaven, we will be punished. But then again, Our Lady said, Russia will convert by when the Pope consecrates Russia, and uh, Russia will be used as the instrument to spread the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that means the flags will fly with the heart of Jesus. The constitutions of that age after the punishment 
The constitutions will declare Christ as king of the nations. And the laws will be, the laws of the church and state will reflect the laws of God and the charity of Jesus Christ the King. And the economics will reflect the charity and justice of the heart of Jesus. And that's quite a, that's Christendom. That's like the high Middle Ages. And it'll be something greater even than that. So let's look, look, look at all these saints before us. The martyrs, the great martyrs who shed their blood for our Lord Jesus Christ. They are examples, they are our, our friends in heaven who give us great encouragement today when so many will damn their soul for mortal sin, for a vain little pleasure, for some little gain, and throw their souls to hell for some useless little vanity. And let's look at the martyrs, the martyrs, and I'm taking this from the, the book, The Victories of the Martyrs by St. Alphonsus Liguri, a treasure, this little book, a treasure. And he says, look at these martyrs who multiplied their prayers in the, in the greatest time of their torments. And how often we say, well, I'm suffering, I don't, and I don't pray. I don't want to pray anymore because God doesn't hear my prayers. Look at the martyrs. When they were suffering most, they prayed the most. They intensified their prayers. And he speaks about St. Theodore, who after enduring long tortures, he was stretched upon burning tiles. And feeling the pain penetrate into his very heart, he begged the Lord to mitigate the torture. And he preserved to the end, and he died triumphant. He won the crown of martyrdom. And then there are others, he says, who because they did not pray, they apostatized before they died, after many tortures. And they, their, their salvation was questionable. If we die denying the faith, knowingly and willingly, we cannot save our soul. And so, he brings up the example of the martyrs of Japan. And he says there was an ancient man who was condemned to a protracted martyrdom. And he endured many tortures for considerable amount of time. But he did not pray. He did not ask help from the heart of Jesus and Mary. And so he denied his faith a few moments before he died. And St. Alphonsus says, this is a warning to all of us that perseverance in prayer in the time of temptation and trials is that which alone can ensure us the victory. We must pray. We must pray. St. Alphonsus says, if you pray, you will go to heaven. If you don't pray, you will go to hell. And St. John Berkman and St. Aloysius say prayer should be as easy as breathing. And we must love to pray, to speak to God through the heart of our Lord. That's what He wants with each soul. Because He died for each one of you. And today, He's going to come down from heaven on this throne of His altar and renew His sacrifice of dying for the love of you. And then He's going to give Himself to you in the body, blood, soul, and divinity. He's going to ignite your soul with His divine fire. And you will love Him in return. And, and love the faith that he gave us that comes from him. The Catholic faith comes from, from eternity, from the heart of the Blessed Trinity. And so none of us have the right to compromise the Catholic faith. And that means none of us have the right to accept Vatican II, even in the so-called light of tradition. Because Vatican II teaches a new doctrine, a new monstrous errors that attack Jesus Christ directly as God, as King, as Priest. And we have no right to accept the new Mass or call it legitimately promulgated. And that's why the resistance, because our superiors in the Society of Isaac 10 have now accepted these things, signed on to these things. And we would sin by being silent and going along with it and saying, well, we have to obey. We have to obey. That's false obedience. And that will not excuse us at our judgment. 
And Archbishop Lefebvre understood this very well. That's why he had appeared, he appeared disobedient to Pope Paul VI, Pope John Paul II. But he told them, you have no right to go against your predecessors. All the popes previous to you condemned what you're teaching. Ecumenism, religious liberty, the idea that the democracy within the church, freedom of conscience, separation of church and state, the new mass, the new right of the sacraments. And Archbishop Lefebvre preferred to disobey Paul VI and John Paul II rather than disobey our Lord Jesus Christ and all the popes of tradition. And who, who was more pleasing to God? So you see in these great martyrs how the love of God inflamed them to endure suffering. <coughs> that for us in this life, we can endure all our trials of this life, the crosses, the pain, sickness, out of love for God and the trials of keeping the faith. We would all love and prefer to have Mass in a big church in a cathedral with beautiful altar and beautiful statues and bells ringing. That would be normal. It was normal for centuries and centuries. But God wants us back in the catacombs. God wants us to fight for the faith and say like St. Athanasius, they have the churches, but we have the faith. They possess, the, they hijack the churches, but we have the faith. So, St. Gordianus, who was suffering very much in his torments, St. Gordianus, who threatened, was threatened to be put to death if he did not deny the name of Jesus Christ. And St. Gordianus, what did he say? Oh, okay, I'll deny him so I can live. I'll deny him so I can get money and uh, get out of these torments. No. Here's what he said, you, you threatened me with death, but my greatest regret is that I can die only once for Jesus Christ. And you had many martyrs in England who said this also in the 15, 16, 1700s. And St. Margaret, uh, Saint, uh, one of the women saints in England who housed the priests and they said mass in her house, and she was arrested, and she was put to death. Anybody remember her name? Margaret Clitheroe. Clitheroe. Yes, Margaret Clitheroe, St. Margaret Clitheroe. Yeah, she was martyred by having uh, uh, her back on an arched rock, and they put a weight on her back, so her ribs and her bones just crushed right through her body. And she told the guard, she told the judge, if I had, I wish I had a hundred lives to give for Jesus Christ and for the love of the faith and for the priests who kept the faith. She would risk her life having the priests in her house. That meant automatic death or heavy fines. So he said, St. Gordianus, I wish I, I regret that I have only one life to give for Jesus Christ. St. Procopius said to the, mark, the tyrant who was directing more tortures on him, St. Procopius, he said, torment me as much as you want, but know that to one who loves Jesus Christ, nothing is sweeter than to suffer for his sake. How often we forget this and we complain, but our Lord gives us trials and crosses so we will suffer for the love of him to help save other souls from going to hell. And St. Bernard said, and so did the saints speak, because they were, did they not feel their torments? No. They were neither frantic nor insensible to pain, but the love of Jesus Christ caused them to esteem all suffering a joy, and to suffer and to die for His glory. This is the spirit of our Catholic ancestors. And we must have this spirit. And listen to this. This is a little treasure I'm going to share with you today from St. Alphonsus. It's very beautiful and we must not forget this. He speaks about St. Mary Magdalene de Passy. And she, among many, many, many thousands of other saints who are not martyrs, like St. Joseph, he was not martyred. 
but they ring the crown of martyrdom. It's called white martyrdom. The church calls them confessors. Archbishop Lefebvre was not martyred, although they, they almost took his life four or five times by bombs and uh, they tried to kill him. But he never died a martyr, but he's, he wept tears. He sweat the blood of the fight for the faith, being punished by unjust popes, being expelled by unjust and bad bishops, and by the press and the governments of the modern Western world who were about to arrest him before he died because he said France is being invaded by Muslims and France must stay Catholic. And the Muslims were going to come against him. So Archbishop Lefebvre oppressed on all sides. He died a champion of the Catholic faith. But he suffered a white martyrdom like all of you. You taste this. You know what I mean when you suffer, you lose your friends, you lose your parish, you lose the priest you once knew. I lost many brother priests who I prayed for. But they're not, they're going with the, the steps towards the conciliar Rome. You lose family friends, family and friends. This is a white martyrdom. And listen to St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi. She was a Carmelite nun, her body is incorrupt. And uh, every time in the divine office, the monks and the priests and the, the nuns, they bow their head. And the monks go profoundly bow when they sing the Gloria Patri, the glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? And every time she said this prayer, she would offer it as if she was laying her head down on the block to have her head chopped off for the love of Christ crucified. Like St. Thomas More, that's how he died. He paid the executioner, uh, he gave him his last few coins, and he said, take this as a tip, and do a good job, because you, you sent me to heaven. And so, every time she lowered her head, she would offer it as if she was dying for the faith. And what's really interesting is this, as often as anyone offers himself to undergo martyrdom for the love of God, so often he gains the merit of martyrdom. And St. Alphonsus teaches this, who is a doctor of the Catholic Church. And he says, we shall see in heaven the great number of saints crowned doubly with the merit of martyrdom without having been martyred. Because they, they were always ready to die for the love of the Catholic faith, of God, and they were always ready to die for their neighbor. And that's the love we must have. This is what the love of early Catholics, they were ready to die for each other. And that's the love we must, we are commanded to have. And Christ does it. He did it on the cross and he's going to do it again very soon in the consecration. Lay down his life for you and feed you his own blood and his own life, his own divine fire. So we must ask the Mother of God, help us. She is the Queen of Martyrs. Did she suffer martyrdom? Did she die? Was she executed, crucified, beheaded? No. She died a peaceful death. But she, she is Queen of Martyrs because she stood at the foot of the cross before the King of all martyrs, Jesus Christ. And she, she will give us the strength in these days to keep the faith and not compromise the faith. And uh, that's why, very briefly, very briefly, Archbishop Lefebvre, if he was asked today, would you encourage others to stay in the Society of Bison 10? He would give the answer that he would say when he was alive in 1988, 89, 1991. And he told the people and he told the priests, do not go to the masses of St. Peter because they have compromised the mass, they have compromised the faith. They accept Vatican II, they accept the new mass. Don't go to their masses, but they're valid, this is Latin mass. And he said, the danger is not in the mass itself, but in the sermons, in the coffee and donuts afterwards, in the bookstore, in the whole ambiance of the novice order. And now we have Bishop Filet inviting modernists, 
into the seminary to speak to the priests and meet with the seminarians, Bishop Schneider, who came to Winona, and uh, Cardinal Brandmuller, who came to his Eichstoffen in Germany, and then Flavine, Bishop Schneider also visited. And read recently the, the wonderful letter of the Catholic youth movement in France. Try to get a hold of this letter, it's powerful. It'll show up on Ecclesia Militant soon. And this letter was written by the Catholic youth of France, at least the core of them. If only our youth in the Canada and the U.S. would fight and wake up to the great heroic battle that's before them, instead of going mush with the modern world and compromising the faith. But this letter is, is powerful. And to that, Bishop, Bishop, they quote Bishop Follet praising the fact that, yes, we had Bishop Schneider and Cardinal Brandon visit our seminaries as a great thing. And then they show the quote of St. Pius X, who says, and do not let any modernists who hold heretical and modernist ideas kick them out of the seminaries, kick them out of the teaching faculty, says St. Pius X. And any seminarians that show favoritism towards modernism, expel them at once, says St. Pius X. Compare that to Bishop Fillet allowing these modernists to come into our seminaries. So read that letter, and let's proceed now to the King of Martyrs, our Lord Jesus Christ, crucified. This is our strength, this is our whole life, Jesus crucified. That is the Catholic faith, Jesus crucified. Because he shows the, the tremendous love of God for the Father to pay the justice of sin and for each soul. And the love that each of the martyrs showed by their death for the Catholic faith. They always put first the Catholic faith. Everything else is second, third, fourth, fifth. First is the Catholic faith. That's why we have to be numbered among those few today of resisting Catholics who want to just stay Catholic the way the martyrs were, the way the apostles were, the way the saints were, the way the popes of tradition always were. O Mary conceived without sin, Pray for us, for every first to thee. O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us, for every first to thee. O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us, for every first to thee. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.